and welcome to On The Ledge Podcast. I am your inimitable, occasionally irritable, but never insipid host, Jane Perone. Tissue culture. We're hearing about it more and more in the world of houseplants, but what is it? How does it work? And what does it mean for the future of our plants? Chris Reynolds of Tissue Culture Lab Seedless Labs in Massachusetts in the US joins me to answer all my tissue culture questions and yours too, I hope. Plus, we'll be hearing from listener Carl in New Zealand for Meet the Listener. And I answer a question about an ivy with a soil that's turned to a brick. Thank you to Twana and Miranda, who both became patrons this week. Your name doesn't have to finish with an A in order to become a member of my Patreon community, but it doesn't do any harm. And thanks to Evie Mia 95 in Australia for leaving a five star review for the show. And they write, I hope there will be many more years of On The Ledge. Well, I hope so. I was talking to my husband about retiring the other day and I was saying, I never want to retire. I want to keep doing stuff with houseplants till the day I die. <laughs> I think he might uh, might be slightly keener to retire and go and watch cricket around the world. But provided it's in places with lots of interesting plants, I'll be happy to tag along. Couple of items in the on the ledge inbox this week I wanted to bring up. Thanks to Christian for getting in touch to tell me that the wonderful podcast 99% Invisible has just done an episode about peat and its vital role on our planet. I do urge you to go and have a listen and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. If you've heard me bang on about peat in the show before but why wondering why do go and check that out because it's a really nice summary of all the reasons why we shouldn't be using peat in our potting mixes. Thanks also to Derek for picking me up on my mention of leaf mould in the potting mix ingredient series. Derek writes, one thing that I felt would have been good to emphasise in the segment on leaf mould is that many native insects overwinter in the leaf litter. So for people with trees on their property, it's best not to get too zealous about the fall leaf cleanup. Not that I think collecting leaves for potting mix is a bad idea. Even a smallish tree will have plenty of leaves to go around, but there are ecological benefits to letting at least some leaves stay where they fall. This is very true, Derek, and I'm very glad that you've brought this up. You're absolutely right. Lots of people love getting those horrible things known as leaf blowers out and collecting every single leaf from their garden. I ask myself, do you have too much time on your hands, (laughs) for one thing? In my garden... I tend to leave any leaves that fall in beds because they're just doing their leaf litter job, as you say, Derek, and providing overwintering territory for insects and other creatures like hedgehogs who do sometimes come through my garden. I do pick up leaves that fall on the lawn because that can kind of smother the grass and cause problems. And usually I just pick them up when I'm mowing. And if you've got leaves on your lawn, you can always just dump them into the flower beds. You don't have to make a special container for leaf mould, unless, of course, you want to make it for the house, in which case you would need to make some kind of leaf mould container or place the leaves into a black plastic sack. And in fact, because I don't have many trees bordering my garden every autumn, I tend to pick up leaves that are being offered by other householders in the area who don't have anywhere to put them. So I usually end up with a few extra bags of leaf mould that way. So even if you don't have a very big garden and do have a lack of leaves, you might be able to get a bag or two, stick it somewhere out of the way for a couple of years and get some leaf mould that way. But thanks very much, Derek, for pointing out the importance of leaf mould and do leave lots of leaves around your garden for wildlife to enjoy if you're lucky enough to have that outside space. And a reminder that there's no episode next week, October the 30th. I'm taking a few days off to spend with my family. So the show will be back again on November the 6th. Thanks to all of you who've supported Legends of the Leaf on Unbound, my forthcoming houseplant book. I'm at 38%. It's getting there. I'm getting there. So that's really exciting. Do check out the show notes if you want to find out how to make a pledge. If you've got any questions about how it works, far away, I will be happy to help.
And I've been on a few podcasts recently. You can hear me on new podcast, Gardeners of the Galaxy with Emma Doughty, which is a wonderful podcast. And we talk about plants in space. You're probably all too young to know what I'm referencing there, but uh, anyone who likes the Muppets might know. Anyway, it was really lovely to speak to Emma, who made a podcast years ago that was one of the very first podcasts I ever listened to. And it's great to have her back into podcasting. You can also hear me on the Joe Gardner show talking about houseplants. And I did an Instagram live with garden designer Dermot Gavin on Wednesday this week. If you check out his Instagram, you'll find that there. He's at Dermot Gavin, which is D-I-A-R-M-U-I-D-G-A-V-I-N. And again, that will be linked in the show notes if you want to take a look. Oh, I do get about, don't I? Well, especially at the moment when I'm trying to uh, hawk my book around. But there we go. That's the nature of crowdfunding. There's been a great deal of noise out on social media and the internet more widely about tissue culture and houseplants in the last few years as their popularity has soared. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it does my head in, as we we would say here in the UK. There seems to be a shroud of secrecy around tissue culture and what it means to our houseplants. So I decided to do my best to remedy that lack of info. And today's interviewee is an excellent person to shed some light on this fascinating topic. Chris Reynolds runs Seedless Labs in Massachusetts, a tissue culture lab that specialises in ornamental plants. Yes, indeed, all the lovely things that we like to grow. Chris was kind enough to sit down and talk to me about the whys and wherefores of tissue culture. Do head over to janeperone.com to check out the show notes as you listen. Chris, I can't tell you how excited I was when your email dropped into my inbox, or, or maybe it was a, a, an Instagram DM, introducing yourself, because tissue culture is one of those topics that's been at the back of my mind for quite a while, as something to cover on on the ledge. Us growers don't seem to know that much about it. It's a term that's bandied around, but there isn't that much information out there about it. So I'm delighted to have you on the show to demystify this topic. I guess the first really basic question is, can you just explain to us in terms that that I'm going to understand what tissue culture is and how it differs from from the other ways that we might be propagating plants for the houseplant market? Uh, The basic principles of tissue culture are you're going to take just a small sample of the tissue material from the plant, whether that's a section of leaf, a piece of the stem, a single node, and you're putting that into a completely clean environment for that plant to grow. Um, Within that environment, you're giving it all of the nutrients that it needs, sugars, micronutrients, macronutrients to give that plant every possible chance to grow the best it can in that environment. Uh, Typical propagation methods of chopping a node and and waiting those months for it to eventually grow roots and then start putting out a new shoot, you're kind of taking control of that when it comes to tissue culture. You're immediately telling the plant to start growing those new shoots and ignore any type of rooting activity. So all of its energy is going in right from the beginning to create a new shoot and then as many shoots as possible. Right. So it's giving you speed that you wouldn't get from other forms of propagation. And also, presumably, in that very sterile environment, you're not going to be subject to any conditions like viruses coming in, things that might come in and affect your crop. Correct. And that is one of the major benefits of tissue culture. Um, a lot of the industry, that's their main focus now, is is elimination of disease and pests within their crops. When they know they can start a brand new fresh crop with material that has no disease, no pests. They're one step ahead of anything else that could go wrong in that process. So when you're starting that that grow with brand new fresh tissue cultured plant material, you know you're not getting any type of disease that's coming from another greenhouse. Everything is coming directly from a, a completely enclosed, secure environment where none of that stuff can grow. 
directly to your greenhouse. So any of those problems that come up are going to be on the greenhouse side. So how much plant material do you need? Presumably not much in order to eventually produce quite a lot of plants. And and where are you getting that material from? I mean, really, the plant material can come from any source. Um, any plant that you have sitting on your shelf, you could take and do a tissue culture of. I mean, you, you need a very minimal amount of material, but it has to be clean material. So you want uh, that that newest growing tip of, of a plant uh, that has the, the youngest cells inside of it to, to be able to multiply that much better. So if you have a plant that has, say, 10 nodes on it, you're probably going to chop those top two nodes from the plant and be able to put those into tissue culture because they're young enough, they have enough of those cells inside them already um, that they want to continue doing that process where the older parts of the plant, they've kind of lost all of those hormones. So their only focus is the tip of the plant growing and roots growing at the base. Uh, you're kind of controlling that beyond there. So you've started your own tissue culture lab in Massachusetts in the US. It's called Seedless Labs. How long have you been going and why did you just decide to start this particular business? Yeah, so this has kind of been a passion project slash hobby for, for many, many years for me. But lately with What's been going on in the plant market, this was kind of the push that I needed to go, okay, I have these skills. I see all of these problems that are happening. Why am I working for, for somebody else to, to do what they choose? This is my chance to actually have an objective look at the plant market and say, okay, what's happening? What can I help? What can I prevent from happening? Uh, and you don't really get that if you are working for somebody else. You're, you're typically, going at whatever the quickest, easiest plants are going to be. You want mass production of whatever's simple. You don't have any major labs that are looking at the plant market day to day going, okay, this is the plant that's being poached right now, or this is the one that the hype blew up overnight from. And with tissue culture, you're solving these problems in, in a much shorter basis. I mean, you're looking at six months to a year to to have something solid in your hands to be able to send to market where typical chop and prop methods are, are going to be years to to get uh, any amount of plants ready to to go to market. And are there many tissue culture labs in the US? Tissue culture right from the very beginning. So we're talking all the way back to late 1960s, early 1970s, when this this really started to take off and, and the knowledge started to be built around it. It was pretty much instantly sent overseas. Most of the tissue culture labs right now are are located in Asia and South America. So they are the main producers right now for for most tissue culture in the whole world. Um, you've got a small, a couple small labs in each country that are, that are kind of doing their own thing. The occasional grower that has a big enough operation to have their own internal tissue culture lab. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, it's really, it's really academics and outside of the U S is that because it's like a lot of, uh, I don't know, putting it in sort of business terms, manufacturing that it's a, it's a labor intensive and therefore it, the, the labor costs are lower in other countries. Yeah, that, that is the biggest cost of tissue culture is, is labor costs. It's a lot of hands on every part of the process. You need a human being in a sterile environment doing this work. And again, it's, it's become pretty cost prohibitive in, in certain countries to have that level of manpower for something like that. And so is that part of your, your job and what you're trying to do to be keeping a really close eye on what's going on in terms of plant trends and identifying things that are up and coming so that you can, get ahead of the curve and, and have those plants available. Uh, you know, obviously you're a business, but partly altruistically in terms of uh, this is the next big thing, it's going to get poached from its natural environment. Let's try and mass produce this so that we can make it more available. That is definitely my ultimate goal is to prevent as much poaching and theft and all of this stuff that has started showing up recently within the plant community that... Again, if people knew what tissue culture was capable of, they would probably have the patience for what could come from it. Again, that one lost plant in nature 
could easily be put into a single test tube and turned into thousands of plants. So you're looking at a single lost plant from nature versus the thousands of lost plants from nature that are probably going to die after being removed from their natural environment and, and stuck inside your living room. Is that another key point then, that plants are produced from tissue culture? Are they tougher than plants that have been propagated in other ways or, or more adaptable? Uh, I would say more adaptable. You're, you're controlling the environment right from the beginning. Uh, you're also able to monitor how those plants are growing. You could have a plant that's uh, towards the edge of the lighting but growing extremely vigorously that you could then subculture beyond that and see if those traits continue. You could very easily have a, a begonia that normally is, is requiring full to partial sun that for whatever reason in tissue culture grows fine in, in low light to, to partial light. And that can then be cultured out to make a plant that is, is suitable for, for your needs. I mean, when you're talking about tissue culture, we sort of hear all these things bandied around on social media about monster Thai constellation and philodendron pink, pink princess and the idea of sports coming out of tissue culture. Is that something that you're looking out for when you're tissue culturing a particular plant for any plants that are exhibiting any, any specimens that are exhibiting unusual or different uh, desirable characteristics? Yeah, I mean, that that is a lot of what people are doing with tissue culture. It's it's hunting those those random sport mutations, uh, whether that be within houseplants or agriculture. There's always that next step that can be taken to find out what that plant is capable of. And with tissue culture, you're, you're expediting nature. So in nature, you're going to have that random sport variegation or mutation in, say, one in a hundred thousand plants. Well, your average grower is, is very rarely going to hit the number 100,000 plants in a normal environment. That's very feasible within tissue culture. You're turning individual plants into 30, 40, 50 plants, um, giving it a, a higher likelihood of, of producing deformities or, or variegation patterns or, or whatever that may be. And, and that leads back to even a lot of the plants that you see nowadays wouldn't really exist if it wasn't for tissue culture. Um, you've got stuff like the philodendron birkin that was a random sport mutation within tissue culture. So that plant has never seen nature before. Um, the Calathea dotty. There's just so many plants that you see, the Thai constellation, um, those plants that you just see day to day and really don't think about what happened. And even when you hear the term sport mutation, even in my mind leading up to to learning tissue culture, I always pictured a gigantic greenhouse with a thousand of the same plant that somebody's walking around checking the leaves to see if something strange pops out. But nowadays, that's, that's all happening inside of a test tube. That's all happening in a lab somewhere where somebody's looking at a shelf of test tubes and going, OK, this one did something different. And is there any way for, for those of us who have plant collections looking at our plants to say, Oh yeah, that this plant has X, Y, Z characteristics. Therefore, it's definitely a tissue cultured plant when we get them one, by the time they reach our homes. The biggest telling factor for that, I would say, would be the density of the plant in the pot. A lot of plants are, are going to grow a single shoot at a time. So when you see things like most calathea, those are, those are a plant that's pretty slow growing that you're going to get uh, one or two shoots every couple months that pop out. But when you see the plant in store, it's it's a small four inch pot with dozens of shoots in it. That's not the natural pattern that a plant is going to take. You're going to get those individual shoots at a time. So when you see the calathea, the philodendron that has four or five babies coming out of the bottom of it, that's not natural. Um, so that's probably the biggest the biggest tell is is how dense the plant actually is in that pot and and does it grow that way in nature uh beyond that uh, almost 80% or more than 80% at this point of plants sold in any type of big box store are coming from tissue culture so just talk me through the whole process from start to finish what kind of time scale are we talking about presumably you're not bringing the plants to market size in your lab you're sending them on to be grown on correct what's the the, the sort of time scale you're working to so you're looking at about 90 days to, to have your baby plants 
to a point to start multiplying. So about three months to, to have that initial tissue culture kind of ready to start multiplying to meet whatever that demand is. So roughly six to nine months from your initial culture, you're, you're ready to have those, those baby plants sent off to a grower somewhere. So that's pretty quick. That's really quite amazing that that's happening in that t- kind of time scale. One of the things that I was interested in that, that I noticed on your, must have been your Instagram, I think, was that you're kind of opening up the opportunity for people to come to you and say, I've got this plant, can you tissue culture it for me, please? Which seems like an kind of an out of this world option that I mean I'm obviously not in in the US or in Massachusetts so I'm not going to be coming to you the plant but I mean are you open to people coming to you and saying look I've got this amazing plant and I want you to tissue culture it to me how does that work most definitely so I love to just have the conversation around what people want to do whether it's me helping them learn how to do it on their side or it being something that I do I really just want tissue culture to to spread wide it's Again, one of those secret communities that doesn't need to be secret. It's it's not secret information. It's it's science, uh, and science can be replicated by just about anybody. And that's kind of my goal is to make people realize that that's all it is. It's just science standing between them and and something that they don't understand. Do you have an understanding of why why there is this sort of veil of mystery around tissue culture? So the biggest thing with tissue culture right now is. Most of it is funded academically, which means there's always a monetary goal in mind. So most of the academics are, are now geared towards crop-specific tissue culture, finding those sport mutations within grapes to find a sweeter grape or a crop that's resistant to a specific disease or uh, like bananas, for example, there's there's major problems with with bananas in general but because of tissue culture we've been able to go back and extract what's needed from the plant to generate a new clean plant over and over and over which is the only thing that's really keeping bananas surviving the way they are right now because they are so prone to disease and, and other issues that it's a crop that needs to be constantly replenished that never would be capable of of what it has to be without tissue culture. Jackie got in touch to give me a tale of woe about an ivy plant and a dracaena called Norman. I don't know why that made me chuckle, but the name Norman just uh, tickled me somehow. Anyway, so uh, the ivy, which, well, I guess, uh, is the ivy called ivy (laughs) or is that too obvious? Anyway, the ivy, the header helix called ivy, has got a problem with watering, as has Norman. And Jackie writes, I took my ivy out of its plastic container because when I stuck the water meter in it, it seemed like it was remaining drenched down towards the roots, but it's completely dry on top and along the sides, which is strange. It gets sufficient light, so not sure what's going on. Norman, my large Dracaena, presents with the same issue. Every time I stick the moisture meter in, it reveals that it's soaked, but it's really not. Like the soil is some kind of a brick that's moist in the middle. Anywho, it's been about two weeks And the ivy has gone on to lose a load of leaves which are turning yellow as well. Well, this is a good one. I mean, I'd love to see what moisture meter you have, Jackie, because a lot of these water meters are being sold now uh, online. And I think their reliability is not always great. I find that I've heard lots of reports of people saying that their moisture meters don't work particularly well or are inaccurate. And while moisture meters can be useful, there is nothing better than relying on your own senses to detect when a plant needs watering. And that can be as simple as either sticking your finger into the soil right down to the root ball. Or if you don't like the sound of that, or indeed if the plant is a spiny one, you can stick a wooden lolly stick or a wooden kebab stick into that root ball and leave it for about half an hour to an hour. And when you pull it out, you'll be able to see whether there's any damp compost sat on it or indeed sat on your finger. And that's a really reliable way of knowing whether your plant is moist at root level. 
Heterohelix, the English ivy, it's quite a popular choice for a houseplant, but actually it's not entirely suited to conditions living inside unless you happen to live in a house that has unheated areas where the temperature is doesn't stay at that sort of standard 19 degrees centigrade, 60 six degrees Fahrenheit because ivies really are garden plants and they will come indoors and be okay in the summer and then when the heating comes on assuming you have fairly reliable heating oftentimes these plants will start to struggle the yellowing and falling leaves Jackie well I suspect that the plant is having a bit of a protest about <laughs> something or other it may well be that it is soaked around the roots and that's why it's losing those leaves in order to back up what the moisture meter is saying, you really do need to get your finger in there. I'd want to know what's happening around root level. So I'd be unpotting that ivy and having a good look at the root ball. It may just be that the soil has become compacted and dried out and the plant is pot bound, or as we also call it, root bound. So there's just a mass of roots, which is making the soil go very, very kind of heavy without those essential air pockets that plants need and therefore the moisture meter is not reflecting what's going on around the soil either because of inaccuracy and it may well be that actually the moisture meter is completely right the top of the surface is completely dried out but round by the roots of the plant it's a quagmire <laughs> there's no real way of knowing other than getting down and dirty and getting into that pot and seeing what's going on and the ivy definitely won't like it well indeed Norman the Dracaena won't like it either to have roots that are sat in water uh, stagnant sitting there for weeks at a time and if an ivy is in too warm a room especially in winter time then it is absolute manna for our least favorite pest these red spider mites so it's really worth paying attention to this plant's needs if you do want to have one and if that doesn't sound right for you then do look at other house plants which are ivy-ish but more suited to indoor growing such as Plectranthus verticillatus the Swedish ivy which is a great choice of plant and will cope with that uh, hot dry air no problem I think oftentimes we don't want to do that bit of investigation because it's just it's a bit of a hassle isn't it taking the plant out of the pot and digging around and you don't know what you're going to find and suddenly a two minute job turns into a half hour job as you struggle to repot the plant or whatever but it really is worth looking if you want to identify what's growing wrong with this ivy and the dracaena you didn't send a photo of that jackie but i imagine it's the same story it may be just the compost at the bottom isn't well enough drained and that water sitting around or indeed your moisture meter is uh, up the swanee so so uh, either fall back on the old finger or get yourself a new one. And like most gadgets, it's worth spending a little bit more money on one of these because the really cheapo, cheapo ones that you see on that big website beginning with an A, oftentimes they really are so unreliable as to be not worth it. If you have any thoughts about Norman and his friend Ivy, then do get in touch. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, on the ledge podcast at gmail.com is the best way to get in touch. And now it's back to my chat with Chris, and I wanted to find out more about the ins and outs of tissue culture and how it's impacting on the houseplant industry. Do you think that the huge boom in houseplants and presumably the amount of money being spent on houseplants is going to mean that houseplants do take more of a central role with things like tissue culture? Yeah, I, I hope to see that happen because it, it does... It does seem to be an industry that that is is veering very quickly to one specific area, and that is agriculture, where everything again works exactly the same when it comes to ornamentals. It there's nothing nothing different between how I would would duplicate a tobacco plant versus how I'm going to duplicate a philodendron. Uh, it really does come down to where those needs are and who's willing to fill that space. If houseplant tissue culture had the same levels of investment and attention as food crops where would we be who knows the capabilities are there it it, it really is just where that funding is going to or, or who is is showing that interest of where where their next steps could be but again houseplants are no different than any other plant out there so I mean, I, I I see this going in that direction now that, that there is the boom that there is with houseplants. It's something other people are, are talking about and thinking about and 
up to this point, most of the studies that have been done on ornamental plants have been for medicinal value. So most of the studies that have come out, even for tissue culture, have been with the prospect of finding a medicinal value within that plant. I'm wondering if, you know, things like finding particular sports that have particularly good I mean, I, I always think house plants cleaning the air is a kind of overrated thing. But you can imagine that some tissue culture, you know, work on tissue culture could bring about plants that were super good at absorbing particular VOCs from the air or, you know, grow, grew in a particular way that made them very suitable for a particular kind of environment, like a, a particular kind of green wall. Or I think there's there's many applications that you could make. And with us understanding so much more now about the benefits of plants and biophilia, then perhaps this will be something that will be uh, further investigated. But it, it's fascinating to, to think about what the future holds. One other question I had for you, going back to the tissue cultures such as Thai Constellation and, and uh, Philodendron Pil Pink Princess. If they're a result of tissue culture, why do they still cost so much money in, in, in the sense of the demand and supply seems to mean that they're not that common still. They're not in every single you know big box store in the way that Philodendron Birkin is. Is there a particular reason for that? Is it just because of unstable, that they're more unstable and therefore harder to mass produce? So uh, a couple different things. So the the biggest thing is the the cost associated now with with getting into some of these plants. Again, where most of these labs are overseas in areas that don't necessarily have the access that we have to certain plants that don't have the the money to to make the investment to take a plant that's unknown how to tissue culture and do all of the testing that's needed to figure that out. So if you're going blind as a lab into, say, doing the Thai constellation, I can tell you there's there's really no solid information out there for others to learn how to do a Monstera. So you're kind of running those tests on your own from the ground up, which I, I'll tell you my... My testing for Monstera has started with 50 nodes for me to kind of narrow down what the best concentration of hormones is, to figure out what the best lighting is, whether it should be kept in the dark at the beginning or left in the light from the start. Um, so there is a lot of variables that go into it at the beginning. And when you're talking about a plant with like the Thai constellation or, or a pink princess where you could be paying upwards of hundred dollars a node now it could be definitely cost prohibitive for for some people to even consider working on that plant something like the thai constellation that again was a, a sport that was discovered within tissue culture which led to its its ease of being continually tissue cultured pink princess that isn't difficult and i don't know why it's as expensive as it is um i'll be completely honest with that one <laughs> <laughs> it's a mystery, isn't it? I mean, I guess I'm just hoping that the price of that plant does come down. I mean, I'm, I, I would love to have one. I wouldn't say it's a plant that I'm going to die to get, but perhaps it will be. Perhaps it'll be like Birkin in, the, in a year and a half. It will be much more common. And we'll, there's somebody somewhere in the world who's producing vast ranks of this plant and we're suddenly going to, they're going to flood the market and the price will come right down. That's my hopes. I mean, that's, that's truly what I want to do with some of these houseplants. When I look at something like the Pink Princess that, again, it, it does work no different than the Birkin. I may have a slightly higher failure rate of, of plants, but again, when you're producing 40, 50, a hundred plants, uh, that loss is, is, is minimal. Um, and it's not, again, it's not any diff more difficult than any other philodendron. The work that goes into replicating a, a Birkin is, is the same work that goes into a pink princess. So I think right now we're, we're at a weird point with that plant. So back around 2008, was when that first went into tissue culture and started getting mass produced from a couple labs. For whatever reason, it kind of faded between then and now, and a lot of the labs that were producing it stopped. So if you go back almost 12 years now, most of those pink princesses that have come out since then are, are tissue culture. So whether your plant is directly from tissue culture or 
the mother plant was from tissue culture, chances are you have a tissue cultured pink princess. We'll have to sort of uh, wait and see on that one. Thinking ahead also to other plants that are coming up on the rails in terms of popularity, I'm wondering if there are particular plants that just don't respond well to tissue culture. I'm thinking in terms of Hoyas, as uh, unfortunately I would say as somebody who rather likes Hoyas and likes uh, collecting them and doesn't want to see the price (laughs) go sky high. They seem to be coming up as very uh, increasingly in-demand plants. I'm wondering if they are good candidates for tissue culture because I've never heard, I mean, I know they're sort of semi-succulent, but I've never heard much talk about succulents and cacti in terms of tissue culture. They, they, are, they are definitely an ideal candidate, especially being, again, like the cacti and, and succulents. When they're slow growers, you can control that environment and make things happen a lot quicker than they would on their natural progression. So uh, I actually started looking into Hoyas recently because there really isn't a a huge tissue culture market uh, right now for Hoyas, but I do see that happening. What's the Hoya Carii? That one is the only one that I'm aware of that is being mass produced within tissue culture. But that also means that that door is now open for adapting what worked with that plant to other Hoyas to see if that still works. And chances are it, it's going to be pretty close and the same possibilities will be there. Are there any advantages to the non tissue cultured approach? Are there any reasons why certain plants or that the, will there always be a section of plants that aren't tissue cultured? I really think that that is the biggest limitation is, is having the necessary facilities and and knowledge to do it because it's always going to be, in my opinion, at least a better way of doing things. You're, you're doing things on your own timeline. You're taking a, even for example, I mean, right now we're, we're going into winter and I don't need to run a full greenhouse. I have three metal racks filled with containers of tiny plants that I can continue multiplying throughout the entire winter without any worries. And then as soon as the season hits, I've got all of these plants ready for me. Um, it's definitely the, the approach that I see being best. There's always going to be some plants that may be quicker and easier. I, I don't see somebody spending the time to tissue culture something very basic, something that grows very quickly. But there is still reason to do it. And, and there's, there's a lot of viruses that are, that are transferred between plants. And that's the safest way to, to guarantee that clean stock that you know you're not going to bring in a tray of plugs from XYZ grower and end up wiping out half of your greenhouse because of that. When you're getting that t- that original material that you're using for tissue culture, th- as I understand it, it's kind of like sterilized, isn't it? There's no chance of, of any viruses kind of getting through the tissue culture process because of the way the material's treated. I mean, without getting too technical, am I right about that? That you, you do some kind of process to steril- remove any potential viruses or bacteria from the material? It's correct. So your, your normal tissue culture is going to deal with any of the pests and pathogens that are in and on the plant. When it comes to viruses, that's a little bit trickier. With that, you have to use the apical meristem of the plant. So the very, very top shoot that's coming out, kind of dig down to where it's it's got its newest, freshest bud that's starting there, and then tissue culture that. That typically doesn't contain um, the viruses and, and more damaging things that were typically carried in that plant. But again, any of that stuff is possible to do, and, and that that is what some of the other industries are are relying on tissue culture for specifically. So um, something like the cannabis industry, they have plants that are on a definite time frame that get these viruses, that get these pests, that are eventually going to die or, or lose their vigor. And tissue culture really is the only way to get that plant back to a strong new plant. Is there anything anything you're doing, any particular plants you're working on right now that you're able to tell me about that are particularly exciting or anything you're seeing elsewhere in the tissue culture world, not even necessarily being done by yourself, that kind of is worth noting? Yeah, most definitely. So I'm, uh, I'm kind of an epipremnum nerd, so that's what I like to work with. I'm actually chasing sport variegations right now in a couple different plants. So Cebu Blue being one of those, that's 
that's kind of my my side passion project right now is is hoping that I can get uh, just something weird with that plant to to pop up in tissue culture. Um, beyond that, I'm I'm really trying to work with some of the the less common plants. Um, I don't want to say rare, but the the ones that aren't at big box stores right now that could be. Um, so whether that be uh, like Epiprendum Shangri La, that's such an odd plant that is kind of forgotten whenever anybody talks about that family. And it's, it's such a weird, beautiful plant that grows so slow compared to all of the other ones. Um, so that's exciting for me to get this weird plant or at least a plant that I've found very weird since I started, started working with it out to people. I mean, it's, for me, the, the, the slowest growing plants are, are always going to be the best candidates for, for tissue culture. It's going to be the best way to get something that grows slow or, or doesn't typically survive. It's a lot of fun, honestly, to, to just kind of watch all of these plants sit inside of a test tube and just wake up every day and, and see what they're doing or, or what they're, they're starting to do. Right now, we've seen a huge influx in the United States. Not really sure what lab they're coming from, but the alocasias. So the jewel alocasias, the dragon scale, silver dragon, um, those have been coming out in mass from, from a tissue culture lab, widely hitting the market in the United States, which has made a, a good dent in the price of, of a plant that was once $200 is down to probably around $50 in, in at least the garden centers around me here, which even that is, is a huge step in the right direction to getting these plants into people's hands. Going to, uh, back to the Cebu Blue, there's so much confusion on social media about, is this a Cebu Blue? Have I bought something or is it some other <laughs> some other plant? Can you shed any <laughs> light on that? Because there does seem to be so much confusion about it. People think they're being sold a Cebu Blue and then somebody else comes in and goes, no, that's not a Cebu Blue. And I'm like, I don't know. I, people ask me this question. I, I, I really don't know. But I don't know if you've got any insight into why that particular one is... Is it because it is it the old saw with arrows that the ju the juvenile foliage is very different and there also there's lots of variation within the species as there is with other arrows? I, I think that that is the biggest factor is people, especially stuff that's coming out of tissue culture, those juvenile leaves are not going to be representative of what that plant looks like. Um, even the the leaves that come out in tissue culture may not look like the the plant normally would just because of the environment that it's been kept in. It's in a hundred percent humidity when the plant's not normally dealing with that because of that environment, it doesn't form its wax coat on its leaves yet. So things kind of do grow funky in tissue culture and it's not until you get it into its normal environment and let it start growing that you see what that plant is, is actually going to look like. Cebu Blue, again, it's no different than its green version other than having the, the slight bluish tint on the leaves. That's, that's really the only difference to me between Cebu Blue and just a regular Epiprendum Panatum that has the, the greener leaves on it. When you see them side by side, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious which plant is which, but I can definitely see somebody having only one or the other and not, not understanding which one it is. Um, and I think going back, I, I remember at some point there was somebody um, selling just the regular green version as Cebu Blue. And that tends to be what sours the market quickest is it really just takes that one person of doing something wrong to, to tarnish that plant across the market for everybody. Epipremnum sh Shangri-La this plant, I have to say, is not... I'm, I have to disagree with you here. I find this plant quite disturbing because it, I'm always looking at that distorted <laughs> growth and going, oh my gosh, pest infestation. Yeah. And if I had yeah. one, not that I do, but I'd be constantly panicking that it had thrips or something because of all that weirdness. And I just, it makes yep, my eyes yep. start twitching when I look at it. I'm like, oh no. But I can understand that everyone's <laughs> got their own things that they find uh, appealing. So yeah, don't be led by me on that. But it's an interesting plant because it is very <laughs> twisted, isn't it? It does look otherworldly. It is. It, it's not, it doesn't function like other plants do. It it has those weird crinkled leaves and its growth patterns are are very different than 
its parent plant, which I'm I'm hoping to narrow down. There's there's again little information about um, what the parent plant is of a lot of plants, and that's something that can be researched within tissue culture. So having a plant like that and being able to return it back to its juvenile state is hopefully going to narrow down where that plant actually came from. And that's that's one of my goals as well, to be able to definitively say where some of these plants actually came from. Uh, because there is debate. There is debate on who the parent plant was, who the breeder was for, for so many plants. And tissue culture can kind of demystify a lot of that. Um, another one that I, I, I'm really excited to start working on very soon is the Raphidophora tetrasperma that's had all the controversy around tissue culture and is really the plant that brought that term into most people's vocabulary. I'm still not 100% on why that plant looks the way it does. Well, I've missed out on this controversy. What was the controversy about uh, that plant? There's still debate whether the plant that's being sold across the world as uh, tetrasperma is uh, Raphidophora tetrasperma or Raphidophora petrusa? I think is the name. Uh, yes, this is ringing a bell now. Yeah. Yes, I have heard about that. Yeah. In my mind, the only way I can I can solve this problem is by getting a, a specimen that is definitely not from tissue culture of a tetrasperma and putting it into tissue culture myself um, and seeing what the plant looks like when it comes out. Because I, again, being on the tissue culture side and, and knowing plants look different, it can take a little while. I ran out and got one myself right away when, when they hit market. And I was on the team saying, nope, this is definitely what the plant is. Eventually the leaves are going to look normal. And now we're going on nine months to a year. Um, I think my plant is is probably close to about five feet tall now and is still putting out its juvenile leaves or or the leaves that it's it's kind of permanently with now, which are slightly different than than what you would see in a, a, a wild uh, tetrasperma. Hmm. The plot thickens. Well, yeah. keep me posted on that. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. And one other thing I saw on your Instagram that really got my attention, I and mean, it's been something that I've been wanting to dig into, is your discussion about a technique that you can use at home for, for kind of rapid propagation, which is not tissue culture, but which is inspired by the same kind of logic, um, which is the use of um, cytokinin paste, which I, I think is... Is that term interchangeable with the term keiki paste? For the most part, yeah. It's it's really going to be the same thing. Um, keiki is just a, a term typically used within uh, the orchid community. Uh, it hasn't really bled out beyond that. So I had this listener question, and it occurred to me after I was looking at your, your Insta and things that this actually might be quite relevant for this listener who'd got in touch with me. Jacob has got an Alocasia odora variegata, and this plant... Uh, as basically putting out all white leaves and they're concerned that obviously that's not good because the one green variegated leaf that's left is not able to support the rest of the plant and he's got it under a grow light and he's you know like being all super careful with it but I'm just wondering whether whether that size of kin and pace could be an answer for him in terms of applying that to a node where he can see there's still plenty of green in order to promote more um, new growth that's more sustainable. Yes. Kiki paste is, is the same hormones that are going into tissue culture. Um, right now, the only difference I see is the concentration. Uh, everything that's been made for kiki paste up to this point has specifically been geared towards orchids, which, uh, again, will work with a lot of other plants. We've tested just the regular orchid kiki paste on dozens of plants and seen at least some results from all of them. So, I mean, it tells you that that capability is there. The only thing that we need to really tweak at this point is going to be the concentrations of it. What goes into uh, making that node grow on... Uh, uh, a Hoya is going to be different than what makes it grow out on an Alocasia or a Philodendron or a Monstera. So my goal now is to, to kind of go back to what's happening in tissue culture, what concentrations of these hormones it's taking to, to make that happen inside of a test tube and adapt that to a topical paste that can be used. So is it, is it worth 
people who are kind of interested in this kind of stuff getting hold of some of this paste, which I, I've seen, you know, I have seen it available in the UK. I'm sure it's available in the US as well. And just doing a bit of experimentation with some of their plants, applying it to a node and see what happens. Most definitely. Again, no harm, no foul. If it's a plant that you're not concerned about, I wouldn't say grab your Monstera Albo and start <laughs> slapping this paste all over it for 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 reasons. Um but yeah, I mean, if you have a plant, there, there's no reason not to. I think I, I posted the picture on my Instagram recently, um, uh, Peperomia, that, again, half the leaves had fallen off. My wife made the comment about it, threw the paste on there, and, and sure enough, at all of those leaf sites, we have entirely new shoots coming out. And that was just with, with regular Kiki paste. Now I'm diving into it a little deeper to kind of tweak that concentration and see what works best. But yeah, anybody should go out and just get Kiki paste and try it. It's that that can be just as easy of a first step into the concepts of tissue culture as using rooting powder, because that's also the same chemical that goes into tissue culture when we're trying to get the plant to grow roots. These are all just happening externally now. And is it so it's just a question of identifying the, the those growth points on the plant and applying the paste and that's yeah. it. That, and, and observing, I guess, is it? And observing, yeah. 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 Playing a waiting yeah, game. Yeah, well, that, that <laughs> is the game. We're all playing with all kinds of different uh, experiments we try. But um, that sounds like a really interesting thing to try. Chris, this has been so fascinating. And I've, I've kept you uh, for a good amount of time here. But is there anything else you wanted to, to... Any other things you wanted to drop into this main interview that we haven't covered already about tissue culture? Because it, it's so fascinating. But I don't want to miss anything. If there's anything important we haven't covered... Um, I mean, I would say just look towards the future of it, where we're constantly progressing with tissue culture. I want everybody to feel like they can can learn something new. Um, you don't need to be a, a scientist that spent eight years inside of a lab to, to understand what's actually happening with this. You can take it as simply or as complicated as you want. Um, the future is is definitely going to be a lot more around the actual gene control of the plants. Um, so that is is what the future holds, the ability to go in and, and edit those genetic markers inside of a plant to just make something happen. Um, for example, taking something like a, a tetrasperma that's, that's in tissue culture and being able to edit those cells to make it variegated. That's going to be the future. We're going to see that in a very, very short amount of time, I, I think. Another thing I just posted about recently was um, a team of scientists just discovered the ability to add bioluminescence into tobacco plants. So you're able to take that gene from fungi and edit it into the genes of a tobacco plant. So now you have a tobacco plant that's generating most of its own light. So you can see what that could do within houseplants. Um, if you have a plant that's that's generating some of its own light, you've now taken away uh, that obstacle of, of of lighting in your house. You've got a plant that can can be doing that on its own. Yeah, there's there's just a lot of a lot of crazy stuff that can happen, and I think the more people that get involved, the more people that get their hands on it, the more questions get asked, and the quicker this can happen where it's so secretive i don't want it to be that way anymore i want people regular people to have that interest and go well what does this mean and and take that next step of of learning well thanks so much for joining me today chris i've learned loads and i'm sure my listeners have the same and i'll put in the show notes all the details about how to get in touch with you at seedless labs because i'm sure there'll be a few listeners beating a path to your door for uh for a <laughs> chat as a result of this because uh, it's fascinating stuff so thanks very much chris thank you chris was too modest to say so but seedless labs is also offering tissue culture classes so do pop over to my show notes or have a look at their Instagram at Seedless Labs to find out more and check out what they're doing. And now it's time for Meet the Listener. And today we're hearing from Carl in New Zealand. And I'm resisting the temptation here to do a very poor New Zealand accent, which you should all be very grateful. Hello, my name is Carl. I am a 33-year-old uh, home gardener and houseplant collector here in Auckland, New Zealand. I'm only relatively new listener to On The Ledge podcast, which I discovered during the lockdown after listening to Plant Daddy podcast. 
I've around 300 houseplants, which I dote over, and I always seem to find myself um, collecting more. Auckland is a great place for keeping houseplants because of our very temperate environment and probably one of the reasons why so many houseplants have become weeds in this city. Question one. You've been selected to travel to Mars as part of the first human colony on the Red Planet. There's only room for one houseplant from your collection on board. Which plant do you choose? If I was on my way to Mars and had to take only one of my houseplants, I'd be boarding with my Zamiococulus uh, Zamifolia. I've had it for quite some time. It's quite a large specimen. Um, I really do feel like it's got the tenacity and hardiness to survive that long journey and wouldn't mind the potential lack of water and light that it might experience on Mars. Question two. What is your favourite episode of On The Ledge? I'd have to say my favourite episode is um, 145 with Tyler Thrasher. You both give some fantastic advice about not being bound to normative careers. And I loved hearing Tyler's perspective on plant science and art, all three things I'm very passionate about. Hearing Tyler talk about Black Lives Matter movement really hit home to me, how we still have a lot to do to work for equal rights for all people of colour and support those cultures broken down by colonialism, New Zealand still being one of those countries. Question three. Which Latin name do you say to impress people? The Latin name I say to impress people is most definitely Amorphophallus pinifolius. People always look at you a little funny when they click as to what Amorphophallus actually means. And I always feel a sense of achievement when I manage to say pinifolius correctly. Question four. Crassulation, acid metabolism or gut ocean? While I am fascinated by crassulation acid metabolism and want to try the litmus test on my own crassula one day, I do prefer gutation. I have a Rifidodora tetrasperma next to my bed and love seeing the little droplets at the tip of the leaves. I feel like it makes the plant appear fresh and clean, but also because it's telling me I've probably watered it a little too much. Question five. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? One day I do want to own a variegated monstera, but in New Zealand they are still worth a lot more than €200. Um, €200 would probably only buy me an unrooted cussing. I'd be buying the 20 interesting cacti. I don't have many cacti in my collection and I would love to expand it with some larger varieties. Thank you, Carl. And what an interesting choice, the ZZ plant or the ZZ plant, if you're being particularly English. I agree with you. That would make a great plant to take into space because it is so tough. But I don't know if I'd be a bit bored. I hate to be a downer on uh, Zamiococcus Zamifolia, but yeah, I guess then again, it would be better to have a boring plant that's alive at the end of the journey than an interesting plant that's dead. So I totally understand your rationale, Carl. And if you'd like to hear your own voice on this show, then do drop a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and my assistant Kelly will drop you a line about how to take part. We've had quite a lot of interest recently, so there's a few recordings stacking up. So do listen out. You could be telling me whether you like gutation or Cam, in a podcast near you soon. That's all for this week's show. I shall be back in two weeks, because remember, there's no episode on October the 30th. I shall be gallivanting, as much as one can do during a pandemic with my children, and I will be back on November the 6th with a fresh episode. If you need your On The Ledge fix while I'm off, then do go and check out the thematic page of all On The Ledge episodes, which also includes interviews I've done for other podcasts. And of course, if you're a Patreon subscriber, a legend or a super fan, you can tap into all the extra episodes of An Extra Leaf. Thanks to my guest, Chris Reynolds and to Seedless Labs. I hope you enjoyed this extra long episode. Have a splendiferous week. And if you can't have a splendiferous week, then, well, have a safe week. Corona out.
music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details. Thank <laughs> you.